Ready. Mm -hmm. I am Joe McCormick. I have been in the service for four years back in the 40s. And I enlisted and was able to finish my education at, at an eastern area. I, uh, my wife and I, after several moves, ended up in Danville, which we liked very much. <clears throat> My service in the Army was very diverse, and we uh, ended up in four, four different areas geographically, and it ended up going to England with about 10,000 others at the time. But many of the areas were fine, and having majored in English in college, I was thrilled to be there and any time off we tried to see as much of England as possible, Stratford on Avon and so forth. From there we, our group, which was the 53rd Quartermaster Depot, about 150 people, all GIs, mostly GIs and quite a few officers, we went from that particular area from there, obviously, across the channel to an area in France. And crossing the beachhead, we were not in the beachhead, but we soon occupied their areas. I can come back to that later on. From there to Rennes in France, which I can recite as you wish. That was a university city, and having lived in university cities, I felt very much at home. And we tried to make use of any time off that the Army allowed we, to see the area and to see France as possible. From there, we crossed the rivers and ended up in Germany, through Frankfurt, down to Nuremberg. Nuremberg was a beautiful city, but it was devastated through bombing. And we were in Firth, F-U-R-T-H, which I later found out was the home burial, home birthplace of Henry Kissinger, oh. which we did not know at the time. But the stadium, the famous infamous stadium, which Hitler started many of his speeches we got, got to see that in a beautiful enterprise. From there, we went to Belgium <coughs> by way of Luxembourg. We never seemed to travel in any, in the army, never time, except in, at nighttime or in the rain. So we went from there back on a Liberty ship back to the U.S., Camp Kilmer and back to Connecticut, which was my home at the time. That's pretty much the geographical area. We ended up in five, five different countries. And uh, did we see combat? We were in the area of combat, but we did not, there was no trench warfare in our group. Our mission was otherwise fruitful. I can recite the one in Rennes, France, if you want. Mm -hmm. what, was, what were we doing in Rennes after we crossed the threshold of the channel? We ended up and we were to set up our unit and have a really a large depot base, supplies, oil, all sorts of supplies. And to get there, we had to get the land. So how do you get the land? You negotiate. We found out with the free French who were in charge of the area at that time. The free French were a very rugged type of person. Men and women were tried their best to fight for their country, and we could help would be very, very sorry for them. They had been uprooted by the enemy at that time, by the Axis powers. And we, we uh, had a language problem. I had had 
five years of French, and uh, I spoke high school, college French. I did not speak the patois of the free French, and they they respected it. They they were a rugged crew, as I just said, and they all each one of them carried a Sten gun, which is a, a small machine gun. They kept it at all times right close to them within arm's reach. We had pistols and we were, not, we were, they were our friends and we were their friends. We were there to help them as obviously. So it, it seems as though many of the things that they wanted, of course, they need, needed to get paid for the land, which is thousands of acres, which we would want, we, we, we needed to take care of the needs of storage buildings and so forth. So it was a question of negotiation, how much, where, when, and so forth. We were not lawyers, but we were the ones who spoke French. So we, we were put on duty. The colonel, in his infinite wisdom, felt we could do the job. We were scared to death because they of the Sten guns. We were hoping that they wouldn't get upset and take it out on us. That was the furthest from their throat. They wanted us and want help to help them overcome the Axis powers. Now, is Free French another term for the French Resistance? Or was that, that was another It was problem? interchangeable, Barb. Mm -hmm. uh, the Free French were de Gaulle's people. And de Gaulle was a separate entity unto himself, to use your phrase. He was an icon in there for you. Not everybody liked to go in that point. Mm -hmm. We did not ever see him. He was in the area and we would have loved to have seen him because he was a leader of the, of the resistance and or the free French as the term goes. The question of language, as I said, they, they spoke a patois. It's like French Canuck mm. and it was different we, we, we spoke high school French, and they understood us. We had a, quite a time getting to understand them. They were very respectful of us, but you didn't, we got the feeling you didn't punish, punish them around, and we didn't in any way plan to. We were there to help, and we felt we did. Well, after several weeks <coughs> of negotiation, well, we came to a settlement and took it to our leaders. And we had one choice, and that was to accept whatever they wanted. And we, they, they wanted the money to buy more arms and supplies and so forth. They were, I can say nothing but highest praise for them because this was their country and it was being devastated by the, by the Axis powers. Mm -hmm. So we felt, in a sense, we felt sorry for them, but we, we did everything possible because I repeat, they, are, they were our friends, mm -hmm. and we were their friends. But at the same time, we, we, they needed our money, and that's what the ultimate goal was, and to take over as soon as possible, ASAP. So we succeeded in doing that, and for that we were highly praised by the French government. And some of the things that I have here show that awards were given to us for our negotiation, six men. We did not solve the whole thing, but we, we opened the door and got the property and so that we could build the buildings for the American usage at that point. So the buildings you were going to build were in the devastated areas? Yes, yeah. Do you Ren know if those buildings are still around? I have no idea, but I, I bet they are not, mm -hmm. probably not because they, they were temporary enterprises. Actually, uh, it was a question of our taking over their buildings because we had pe troops and people who needed housing. And the housing was pretty immature, mm -hmm. but we didn't care. It was, it was to help the French. Did you have to negotiate then with some of the citizens or were you mostly through the Free French? Yes, yes. 
not the citizens. The citizens were a separate entity and we ran across quite a few families and they were delightful because they, they wanted to take good care of us and we loved to, their cooking was excellent. So uh, we negotiated with the military, in, in this case with the Free French. This was their bailiwick. And uh, talking with the citizens there, as I said, they loved to feed us. And also we had chances to get on the trains to go from one place to another. And that was an entity of great surprise. The engineers would travel get the engine going with the freight cars. We had stationed one, one of our men in the engine at all times to make sure the engineer didn't stop for a bottle of refreshment or something else. <laughs> we, we never had any problem in that area. So that is, that's the best I can answer, I guess, as I know it. So by that time, the, the Americans had taken back all of France from the enemy, or were there still parts of France that were under siege? Yes. Yeah. Yes to the second one. Mm -hmm. uh, this area was under French control, but it was very marginal. And there were raids going on in our, at nighttime, which we did not, fortunately for us, did not get involved in. Um, but. Actually, the France was still under German control at that time. And the area in which we were located was in between. One night it would be this way and another night would be another. So we were very thankful that the Free French were in our area. Mm -hmm. they, they, had, they had about 50 or 100 trying to take care of us service-wise, because mm -hmm. we were not at that point in combat. Mm -hmm. Our mission was, was supply. Mm -hmm. And once we got the buildings located and cleaned up, which we had to do, which was part of our assignment, that went with the lease. But we learned French law very quickly. Now, you, they, uh, you received an award several years later from your service. About two years ago I got mm -hmm. it. I have it here. Okay, why don't you talk about that? Because that's kind of like coming full circle. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this was a, an award. We, we didn't expect anything from it, and the, the six of us were picked out as being helpful to the French nation as it was designed at that point. And somebody in power in France initiated this as an award to the people, and there were many, many people who were awardees. And this, this award was what they call a diploma. Diplomi is the French word for it. And I got one personally, and the other six or five men got awards also. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this, the award for that was a, not only the certificate, but also it was the anniversary <coughs> anniversary of uh, Normandy D-Day. So the award there was the men who could meet the qualifications and physical qualifications were given a open red carpet treatment to go back to Normandy and walk the beaches again. I would have loved to have gone, but the uh, physical limitations precluded that. I did talk with some who did go, and they said that they were just treated beautifully by the French. The French people were on our side. Not all of the French leaders were. Uh, some went with some certain leaders in France and were sort of in between. Uh, I would have loved to, as I just said, I would have loved to have gone over to all expenses paid and to go to the country again and walk the beaches. We would find many changes. Mm -hmm. Probably w wouldn't know the people, but that wasn't the point. 
they really treated us beautifully. That isn't always the way the media pictured it, but we, we have found nothing of any problem with them. Mm -hmm. did, did you, do you keep in contact with the other five? Or? Yes, we would have reunions of, of our group uh, in New York. Most of them were from the East Coast by circumstance. And uh, we would meet in New York City uh, or Boston and so forth and have a weekend reunion. And uh, it, was, it was very nice to see them, but gradually with illness and other reasons, transfers, of, as I just said, in the car coming down, not all of them are still around, mm -hmm. but the hardcore was still there. Mm -hmm. Now, did you get into, when you, you said you enlisted, so was that like 1941 or two? Mm -hmm. or? 1943. 43. 1942 and 43. Mm -hmm. And at that time, the Pentagon had a program for anyone who enlisted in the Army in certain categories, which would lead to supply and defense and uh, which would be in the quartermaster area. If they enlisted, they would be allowed to finish their education, and we all wanted to. Mm -hmm. Some took immediate entrance into the, most of us went on to graduate school and finished our training and education, and that was a big thing. We were able to get our master's degrees mm -hmm. and go on from there. Now that was after you came back? Or no, was that was right then? Both. both. They had a degree, IA, Industrial Administrator. That was in 1943. And then in 46, after we came back, we got the MBAs. That was all with the, one of the Army's programs to make sure that their education wasn't devastated. Mm -hmm. Well, plus Industrial Administration would have helped you Definitely. Find the buildings yeah. and make sure they were the right kind. That was. We had occasion to use, but it was, it was a lot of the, of the decisions were made on the ground in yeah. France. Yeah. And we weren't that versatile to learn the engineering terms mm -hmm. in France. We had enough trouble with learning the everyday conversation. Mm -hmm. And they were most helpful. I, I can't say enough good things about them. Mm -hmm the ones we had dealings with. Um, was Eileen in the military also? No. But no. Were you were married by that time? No, I was single. In fact, all of our group, the, the six of us, were, were all single guys, mm -hmm. which uh, made us free to, to learn and st learn the studies of where we had majored in college, mm -hmm. if possible. It was, no, I wasn't married until later on, after the war. But I got to see, with the approval of the Army people, we had flights over France <coughs> and Germany on time off, leave, leave time, trips to the Mediterranean. And it wasn't a joyride. We had duties, which I can't discuss at that point. And uh, we made every usage we could, Munich and so forth, in Germany. We tried to do everything possible to help ourselves and at the same time do the duties of the military mm -hmm. as requested. So they would send you behind enemy lines then? or Well, I guess if you were in that area, you were sometimes behind enemy lines and sometimes not. Possibly, mm -hmm. yes. I can't get into some of the details. We were pledged to secrecy on certain things, mm -hmm. even at this late date. Now, where you, the place where you were, did you have access to information about how the war was going, or was communication difficult? Both. Um, it was difficult, and uh, we had dealings with Signal Corps people and so forth. Actually, what we were trying to do was get our missions 
so the, the supplies were complete and on to the front lines because they, they were the men in the foxholes. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, it was our duty to have the supplies ready, in storage, ready to go forward. Mm -hmm. Back to the foxholes. When we crossed the channel, and the first night in France, we were in foxholes, which had been dug by the infantry. And there were shells going over our heads and so forth. And as one man said to me, there are no atheists in foxholes. Mm -hmm. I never forgot that. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, it was pretty rough. Um, did you, uh, sometimes it seems that um, people who have been in a war zone coming back, sometimes now they get counseling, but did, was there anything that helped you make that transition from wartime days to peace days once you came back? I think, Barb, I think the answer to that is it depended on the individual. There was nowhere near the counseling program that they have today mm -hmm. or last year or five years ago. And it, it is, it's a different world. Uh, what we had was very, very piecemeal, and I'm not being critical. It just wasn't it wasn't important at that time. At that time, mm -hmm. because men were needed overseas, they weren't com coming back to the states at that time. I mean, 45, 46, 47. Yes, that that would be more states counseling in these areas of the uh, cities. Of, of military. Mm -hmm. um, when you when you say your job was to get the supplies to the to the foxholes, um, did you have to order the supplies, or you just needed to receive them? Create the building that they would be stored in. I mean, was there difficulty <coughs> getting supplies into your building? Oh, there were certain types. Yes. Uh, oil and gasoline were ultra in shortage, ultra in shortage. And some of the generals, for example, General Patton, made sure that the gasoline and oil was funneled to his troops, his troops. I won't go into the procedures that he used, uh, but they, they were, they were, their job was to go forward, go forward, go forward. And uh, th so it was our job to make sure that they had what to, the materials that were needed to go forward. Food, medical supplies, all obviously needed. It, it was difficult. When we were in one time, when we were in Luxembourg, waiting, we waited quite a bit of the time. This is when we were in transit on our way to Germany. This is as a downturn in the war time. The difficulties that they had were very, very important. And we would go to the bulkheads and the railheads in Luxembourg City while we waited. <clears throat> and this was a, where the military wounded were brought in from the front. And we, the train would arrive at midday and we, we could see the wounded in the, in the trains, in the rail cars, the medical cars. And strangely enough, after one day of that, we decided not to go back. It was too, too traumatic for us, because it, it was awful to see the men who were wounded in serious condition on their way to mass units. So we, we changed our mind after that. Did um, did you have to share? I mean, did you find it necessary to share some of the food with the village, the people in the towns? Did I mean, did they? Te I don't know how to word this. You know, I mean, it, food was coming in and then it was going out to the <clears throat> troops. Was there resentment among the people in the towns about that, or? To my knowledge, I think I know what you're asking. To my knowledge, we never did that. 
we, we didn't know everything that went on. Mm -hmm. And there was no hanky-panky, it wasn't that. But uh, they were so nice to us that the least we could do when they invited us over for a Sunday dinner was to bring something with us. Mm -hmm. But it, we didn't shortcut anything, any of the steps. Mm -hmm. No, we never saw anything. If it did, it was without our knowledge. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there were deviations. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I guess I, I swerved you away from the award. Did you want to talk a little bit more about how you <coughs> came to receive that? Well, after I received it, I got it in the mail. <laughs> came by way of the council office in Peoria, or Bloomington, I'm not sure. And the lady there, Deshane Ducher, uh, she was actually French, obviously, from her name. And she forwarded the award to me, in the one that belonged to me. And <coughs> the other men had the same. And then she, on the phone, Bill Cumbrum uh, on Fairchild Street was very helpful in that, and he managed to expedite this. This was a program initiated by the French Defense Department as a thank you from the French people to the Americans who were qualified, mm -hmm. and we were deemed to fit into that category. Now, this, this award process was begun when I think the French were receiving negative reception from Americans as far as their support of the war in Iraq. Do you think this award helped mend those fences? I have no reason to say that. I, I did not ever see it or hear that. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that it didn't exist, mm -hmm. but uh, I never saw any evidence of that. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel that sometimes the media have distorted what they hear and see, mm -hmm. and what they hear and see may be handpicked to hit the six o'clock news. Mm -hmm. I never saw any of it, and I was got around enough to be able to be alert to pick it up if I did see it. Mm -hmm. so I saw none of it. Yeah. If it existed, I was unaware of it. Um. Speaking about communication, were there uh, news reporters who were with you during the war, with, with your unit, or did you see any uh, people who were covering the war? I guess... The, um, the Ernie Files? Yes. <laughs> no, we didn't. Because I wish there were more Ernie Files. Mm -hmm. There weren't. Yeah. <clears throat> we never saw anything that was bad-mouthing the GIs or the French or the Belgians or the English. Mm -hmm. we, never, we never saw any of that. If it existed, and I'm sure some cases it did, but we, we never saw any of it. Uh, in, in the cases of those men, I, I have a relative who is in a Marine unit, and he, he has talked with men coming back from Iraq at the present time, and he said the ones he has seen and talked with, he said 70 percent of them want to go back. Mm -hmm. now, why do they want to go back? He said because their buddies are over there, yeah. still over there. Mm -hmm. He said they, 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 there are some who don't want to go back, but he said, Uncle Joe, 70 percent want to go back to help their buddies mm -hmm. or struggling. That's mm -hmm. a di different type of wartime. Yeah. But it seems the bond that's created between soldiers is still <clears throat> the same same thing that happens. No that question. Happened. No question. Yeah. It is a, it's a good word. It, it is a bond because if you were in a foxhole and the, the guy next to you gets wounded or you you do everything you can to help him, or these days the women are, are a big factor mm -hmm. and do a, quite a job. But it, it's completely different now. He said nowadays it's very difficult to spot out who are the enemy and who are not. Mm -hmm. And that's what my nephew has said. He is anxious to go over there. 
Mm. He's a lieutenant commander. Mm. <clears throat> He's with the Seabees. And he said, when we go over there, we are going to build buildings. We're going to build hospitals. Our unit of a thousand men is going to build schools. We need, we're there for water supply to help the people there. He said, we do not carry guns. Mm. Well, we carry pistols, but he, he said, our mission is not warfare. It is to help the country. He said, I, I wish the media would tell that. Tell, tell it like it is. Mm -hmm. He said, that is our mission. Mm -hmm. When and if we get called. Um, one of the other people we interviewed talked about um, how uh, careful the government was to uh, get involved in not having information be reported to the general public and, you know, kind of beyond the loose lips sink ships idea, yeah. but it was... Um, the government kind of controlled what people could report. Did you find that, um, well, in your sector, I mean, you've, you've already alluded to some things you still can't talk about. Um, so you probably were in some top secret level things anyway that you couldn't talk about, but um, did you find like letters home and things like that that, that had to go through some approval process? Well, it all had, had to be cleared by the superiors. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I never had any letters returned because I really didn't know enough going on. Yeah. We were too tied up doing military jobs on, on site mm -hmm. and to make sure that the, the AF gas, which is aviation gas, and the oil and petroleum products were more important to us. Uh, that is, our our leaders felt felt they were, and I believe they're right. Mm -hmm. uh, back to the the media. I'm not an expert on media, but uh, I feel that in, in listening to some of the men who have been overseas at the present time, nobody likes to go to war. As I just said, mm -hmm. there are no atheists in foxholes. But what they want to do. He said the media will come in in various areas and go from one end of the mess hall to the other, seeking out the ones who will be good news for the six o'clock news. And he said uh, they skip the ones who are ready to re-enlist. Mm -hmm. so it's a PR battle. Mm -hmm. it's, not a, it's not a popular or a nice thing, but it, it does take place. I'm listening to it third hand. Yeah. Um, it seems so odd to me now that, that during this wartime, uh, the, the soldiers, the military, have access to their cell phones and email, and their families are hearing from them. I have know, heard that. I have heard that. <clears throat> and it may exist. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say it doesn't. but. Uh, we, we, of course, in that day and age, this is the 40s, we didn't have cell phones. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was communication, but it, I would say that I never heard of very, very few had their letters returned to them as being mm -hmm. censored and so forth. Did you have a sense of how long it took for, like if your family wrote to you, was there a really long period that it took for them to find where you were in order to even deliver the mail? I would say so, yes. I don't have any statistics on that, but uh, yes, it did. And I never did check uh, just so long. We, we had the email, as I remember it. And I'm sure it took at least a couple of months, at least. And that's a, an estimate on my part. Mm -hmm. They got all the letters that I remember sending, mm -hmm. and I, it was complete freedom, except on s secure matters. Mm -hmm. And if so, the man who censored them, and that was his job, uh, had no, w would just send them back to the individual. Mm -hmm. but I never ran across anybody who, who had them sent back. Mm -hmm. Did they have any kind of care packages that people yes. would send? Yes, one in particular. Uh, 
I won't say it's a care package, but in a sense it was. It was a, a on a, a Christmas day, I think in 44, I was sitting in the barracks just before Christmas dinner, and I was opening a package. It came from the New Haven, Connecticut Elks. My dad was a member of the Elks, life member, and he had turned my name in as being a, a GI over overseas. And I remember opening it, and there were odds and ends, razor blades, smoking for those who smoked in those days. That wouldn't be in effect now. Uh, also, a little candy and so on. It was a care package. And I thought, oh my God, here they're sending it to me. And I was alone in the barracks at that point, waiting for the dinner, the Christmas dinner. <clears throat> and I sat down and uh, wrote a letter to the exalted ruler and thank him for sending it to me. Mm -hmm. And months later, my da when I got back from overseas, my dad told me that the exalted ruler had said I was one of the few who sent him a note of thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, I felt that way, that's all. Yeah. So uh, yes, we did have, and the USO was quite active. Mm -hmm. I can't say enough for them mm -hmm. in helping cases of men who had problems deaths in their family and so forth, births of your children and so forth. <clears throat> you learn a lot and it, it's good. I think I learned an awful lot and some of the things I can't use these days, but the, it's, uh, it was, we, we were on a mission and we didn't solve it. The, the leaders were the ones who made the decisions. <clears throat> Now you, um, do you have your award with you that you could? It's in the papers here. I, okay. I can give it to you later. Well, I thought sometimes if you just hold it up and then well, Mike can I'll have it. to find it. Oh, okay. Can well, you we cut can it off? after afterwards then. Yeah. I, I'm happy to show it to you. I brought it down. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, is it? It's in this it's pile in of papers. Okay, sure. Yeah. Take it back. Just remember that one. As a matter of fact, I've got the whole package for you, Mike. Are we on or not? Yeah. Uh-oh. This is a package I'll turn over to you guys. This is the award that I received. <clears throat> you want to take this, Barb? Yeah, well, I think if you want to just up. hold it up. Is yeah. That? yeah so. This is a copy of the same one. Looks I'll like give you. Clouds? I'll, is that what's on the. Pardon me? Are those clouds? This is a certificate. Yeah. Yes. I can turn this package over to you if you want. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. This is a letter here <clears throat> from Dominique Béchard, and she is representing the French Council General in Chicago, and this is the letter authorizing this certificate and the trip to Normandy, which I was unable to attend. I would have given my IT to go, but mm -hmm. now here is a list of the things I can turn over to you if you want. Okay. You want to take them now, or uh, no? We can we can wait, and then we'll just make copies. No, this is for you. Oh. Okay. You can keep it oh, or, or send it to Will or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's up to you. Is there anything there that you'd like to read to us? Or? 
Well, I, this is a long letter. She's a very pleasant lady to talk with. I, I'll read parts of it. Sure. Is that a helpful? Dear Mr. McCormick, <clears throat> this is from Dominique Bichar. It is a pleasure for me to inform you that you are eligible to receive the French diploma from the government of France for your contributions in the fight to liberate France from the Axis powers in World War II. July 6, 2004 will mark the 60th anniversary of D-Day, June 6, 1944. Some 180,000 Allied troops landed in Normandy and went on to liberate France. The people of France have never forgotten the sacrifices made on behalf of the, their beloved country. And that's one thing I want to stress. They really loved their country. Not all of them, but the majority of them did. Uh, the, the great pain suffered from the, all of the Axis powers. The Second World War was a devastating time, especially for the people of Europe and the people of North Africa. Many battles were waged, and some 50 to 55 million people were both combat and injured. Forces of, goodness, I'll skip part of it. People of France and my government are delighted to be able to present to you a special diploma. That's the one I have here. And I will give to you in recognition of your unselfish action and your efforts on behalf of France and the free French people wherever. Merci beaucoup. I do remember some of my French. For all those, for everything you did for France, warmest regards. I will turn this over to you. Uh, the, the other papers are related to the work I did. And you had a, another thing you wanted to share was how you got connected with, with the Ken Burns series. With Ken Burns and... Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> I had signed the application from WILL, which was a blank form for anyone who would fit in the category, and I fitted because I proved that I was in Wren in, Nor in Normandy at that time, so therefore I was eligible to be checked out for authenticity uh, of going to Normandy. And I passed the test and, and was given approval through the Veterans Council on Fairchild Street. Mm. So uh, then <coughs> subsequently I saw in one of the bulletins it came out with a Sunday Magazine program, an article, a story by Ken Burns about what he was doing and the item that I showed to you uh, of the book, which he is later putting into a movie, is almost ready for publication. And so I sent that on to the people here and uh, Bill Cumbrum had a copy of that, and uh, he is trying to bring many of the things that I'm stressing were, were really true, <clears throat> and everything was not bad. Mm -hmm. War was bad, but I'm not talking about that at this time. So I think that he forwarded that to the channels of, of the French Council. They have consulates in Chicago and so forth. Mm -hmm. I assume it was went on to higher levels. Mm -hmm. Is that what you asked mm -hmm. me? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Now you, um, a very modest person, but I, I remember you telling me about a package uh, letter that you sent to one of our soldiers in the current war um, and I think your story of how much that care package meant to you must have been yeah. one of the reasons why you did that. 
Can you talk a little bit about yeah. what motivated you <clears throat> yeah. to do that? Yeah. Two things. First, this is the one about the Ken Burns movie, which is in the process of being put together mm -hmm. and will be shown in September. Mm -hmm. Number two, uh, I felt it was a time of stress for families. And actually, I, I felt the same way. And I thought of the one package that I got from, in this case, from the Elks in Connecticut, and they have done many things favorably. I thought, well, why don't you send a letter to some GI? I had a, quite a time getting the names of GIs who were in Iraq at that point and Afghanistan. I finally did through the help of many people. And I wrote pers personal letters to two, two men and uh, in both from Danville, and uh, I sent them out separately, and I said different things to each one about what he was trying to do for his country. Both were Marines at that point. It made no difference whether they were Army or Marines or Navy. Then about three weeks after I <coughs> sent them, I got uh, Letter back, letters back from each of them, three weeks, handwritten and appreciative of the actual things that were being done for the GIs who were living and working under horrendous conditions. Mm -hmm. At least we are informed of that. And I got, took their letters over to the parents. One of them lives on Gilbert Street. And uh, <clears throat> the father was on the, at the porch. I called and said I was coming over with a letter from his son. He was there with the family dog. And when he heard what I was just reciting, that this was from their son, uh, he, he invited me in immediately for supper. I said, I had just eaten. Thank you, and I'll take a rain check. And he said, this is wonderful, he said, he got the mother out, came out on the porch. Dinner was forgotten, I guess, because they had a letter from their son. And unfortunately, when he, he was, he, the father told me he was being discharged <coughs> from the service Marines and would be home in three or four weeks. And I said, I'd like to meet him. He said, I'll arrange it. Well, I later subsequently found out that going to an automobile problem, the boy was injured and fatally. So I never got to meet him. That had no connection with the fact that he sent me. It was a, a letter from him. The other one uh, sent me, sent me actually, I think it was a, a letter of thanks, appreciation. It's a, it's a lonely life. So uh, they appreciate anything that can be done. I have s subsequently sent other letters out. Men tell them we're rooting for them. Well, that must have been hard for that family, for their son to be close to coming home and then... Well, he got home. Oh, he did? He got home. <clears throat> At least I heard that he got home and was discharged, and then he was out uh, visiting his friend and was in an automobile collision and so forth, passed away, which had no connection with his service, but... Uh, it was that always a, seems so hard to take, to It hear. must be horrendous. Yeah. And there's no one way to do it. You can just see it on the news. Mm -hmm. You don't hear of all the nice things that happen. That's what my nephew was saying. Mm -hmm. He said, Uncle Joe, we're doing so many good things. I wish they would publicize the good, many, many of the good things mm -hmm. and, and some of the things that are rough, those should be taken care of in the proper channels. Mm -hmm. When I heard that what my nephew's mission is when he goes overseas, I couldn't help but think, well, he's, he's going to be doing, he's well qualified, he's a professor of geology, and he's doing the work, hospitals, and so forth. Not medical, but 
construction. A little like what you did over there. I mean, as sort far of. as finding yeah. buildings that can yes. be used. That's true. Yeah. But back to the one thing that really got our, made us very happy, we were, there was a shortage of eggs. And we, we had to eat. And it was nobody's fault, it wasn't that, but we were eating dried eggs. Well, they you run dry of dried eggs after a while. <laughs> so we, we would go out, and when we knew that the mess sergeant was going to have a big breakfast for us, we went out and reconnoitered the area, and the French families would save the eggs from legitimate chickens <laughs> and so forth and give them to us. It, it would be a, we would bring candy and so forth. And uh, and the, on the Sunday morning, we would line up at the mess tent with our, holding our eggs. And the man in front of me was a good friend of mine. And just as he got just short of the mess sergeant to take the eggs to cook them up for him, he stumbled and tripped and broke the eggs on the ground. If you've ever heard a man cry, <laughs> it was Artie Seaton. He, he ended up making a second call to get a second repair. The little things were so important to us, mm -hmm. and, and they are for the guys nowadays, mm -hmm. guys and gals. Yeah. We have to think of those things, uh, very important. Mm -hmm. So were the did you have, aside from eggs, that sounds like that was the number one favorite. Did At the point, eggs? certain things become very important. Mm -hmm. Eggs were very important to us. Mm -hmm. And uh, we didn't need clothes, we had uniforms. We didn't need bath supplies, we had laundry units. There were many things that were su supplied by the military. Mm -hmm. But after a while, we, the little things counted. Razor blades were more important than many other things. Yeah. Did you have access to fruit? Is that one of the... <clears throat> if so, it came from the French gardens. Mm. Yeah. But uh, back to the engineer crossing the, the country of France. We left Rennes and went across to Verdun. That was the other side of France. And as I said, we went in French freight trains, 40 and 8, and they're really 40, and GIs and so forth. And some of us who spoke French again were put up in the engineer's cabin of the train to make sure that he kept up the speed and so forth. And every hour on the hour, the train would stop. And what was it? There was a custom in the French labor union they would have a bottle of wine, the engineer. And we were there to make sure that he didn't take more than 15 minutes till he went on to the next one. So that's where we had the carbines. We didn't dare use them because we felt he needed the wine. <laughs> they also had a French, French bread. French bread was priceless. And that was another thing that was very, and for everyone, we rotated every four hours, riding the engine to make sure that the engineer, the engineer, did what he was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. They understood what we were doing, did but that was their that was their union <laughs> ruling and so forth. So every hour that he stopped, he got a bottle of wine. Well, I I I'm going to withdraw the question because <laughs> I I don't want to say I don't know I don't remember. Did you ha did the uh, the Free French have to accompany the trains to make sure you all were safe? No, they were fighters. Oh, they were fighters. The others were service, <clears throat> and we were there to make sure everything was, as they say in Brooklyn, kosher. Yeah. Yeah. No, the the, the Free French were were fighters, and they they were dominant, wonderful, yeah. and they they wanted to get as much money as possible, which is that, that was their their mission. And our mission was to make sure we got what we, and the lease and so forth was right. We had to learn some of the French legal terms. It was very challenging, we learned. 
I was glad I took five years of French. <coughs> Did you have anything else that uh, has come to mind that you would like to share? Well, yes, I think there's <coughs> one thing that occurred to me on any time off, authorized time off, we had a chance to go on leave trips. And one of them was to <coughs> either to Switzerland from where we were, this is when we were in Germany, or down to the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean trip was take it next week, Switzerland, wait two months. Well, knowing how things worked, I, I took mine right away because it might be canceled. Mm -hmm. Once in a while I was right, it was canceled. So I ended up going to the <clears throat> Mediterranean and we're in Monte Carlo, which was a separate country at that time. And I, by coincidence, going through the beautiful countryside, flowers were tremendous. Perfume was made there. Chanel number no. five was very, very popular. We could purchase it. I was seated with a, beside a, a an American ACAC -AC, anti -ar 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 aircraft. And he was a master sergeant, so we got talking <clears throat> while we were on the bus going from one location to another. And I said, did your unit sergeant shoot down any planes? Because that was their mission. He said, yes, he said, we did. He said it was the wrong one. I said, what do you mean the wrong one? He said, we, we were, every night we were on duty. Planes would go overhead <clears throat> on the way between Germany which was taken over by the Americans, not by, not, well, I'll skip that. Uh, and he said, we would, if we were, we tried to have them identify themselves and by blinker. And he said, if they identified themselves, we would not obviously fire. They were allied planes. He said, one night a plane went overhead we, ident we blinked for identification, and it did not respond. We blinkered for a second identification. It did not respond. The plane did not respond. By that time, it was almost getting out of our sight, so the, our captain said, fire. So he said, we fired, and he said, Joe, he said, we hit the plane. And he said, we were ecstatic. I mean, it was a... It was, very, it was very difficult to do, from even with the artillery. He said, when we did, the plane went down in flames. We could see it. So <clears throat> we celebrated that night because we had hit a target. It was very difficult to do. He said our captain was going to Paris on an assignment. We asked him to check out why we didn't hear affirmative or get an award or something. He said, when the captain came back from Paris, we asked him, he said, as Master Sergeant, I asked him, did we get the award? And the captain said, you can forget the award. Why? He said, we hit the wrong plane. We hit a, an American plane by mistake. Now he said, we did everything right. But he said, it, was, it, was it did not identify itself. So really the plane did the wrong thing. And it was, now the bad part was, not only that, but there was a person on that plane who was very well known, and it was Glenn Miller. He said Glenn Miller was overseas and played for the troops, and he said he happened to be, the record showed that he was on that plane. Then he said, we, that's, I have heard how Glenn Miller died. They're all mysterious cases. I have to believe the master sergeant. Mm -hmm. He said, we got the facts. He said, it wasn't our fault. We, we, we did what we were supposed to do. He said, that's how Glenn Miller died. I have to believe the master sergeant. Yeah. That was a very unfortunate situation, yeah. obviously. 
But those are the things that happen in, in wartime. You don't plan for them, you can't plan for them. You do everything possible to avoid them. Yeah. And you do the best you can. At that point. Yeah. And there, there's no way they would ever have found out why they didn't signal. <coughs> no, because men were all killed in that Allied plane. That was as bad as the medical railhead when, as I recited earlier, we couldn't stand it after one day. Our stomachs were not that strong. It was tragic. That's why I liked the show MASH so much. It was very realistic. It was comedy, but it was it was real.